So once again, uh, we are really privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Hedley Swain, uh, Chief Executive and Director of the Royal Pavilion Museum in Brighton, uh, a, a huge dome structure. If any of you visited, you can't miss it. It's right in the center of the town. And uh, he, we, you know, he's already done one uh, conversation with us, which was on the theme of migration and oral history. And I, I really remember one of the quotes he said, uh, which I had never heard before. I mean, he's said many things to me, which I've never heard before. So he's one of my heroes. <laughs> Hedley said that you Janes are making history in Britain every day. Yeah. And he, you know, he was talking about us as a community and every one of us, whether in terms of, uh, you know, leaving, living peacefully in a neighborhood or going to work or going to school, etc. And uh, today uh, he's going to expand on this subject called intangible heritage. Intangible heritage means uh, the inheritance, which is not material, which is not about our wealth but about our culture, our history, our music, our poetry, literature, etc. And he's going to elaborate and try to explain to us how priceless all of this is. You know. Now, uh, I'd like to take Headley back to his first visit to our Oshwal Centre here in London in Potter's Bar, which was in 2010. And it was in the spring and we were having our Ambel Festival. At this time, both Headley and I were on the board of the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, which is a heritage organization. And, you know, Headley comes with a strong background in history and in heritage protection, preservation. And he feels very strongly about this subject of intangible heritage. So Headley, uh, try and cast your mind back to that first visit where you came to us uh, for the first time, you came to visit us as a community and to see us uh, play without any play acting, you know, see us in our own, uh, uh, what do you call, context. Thank, thanks at all, love, as ever love, lovely to talk, talk to you and talk, talk about the Jane community. I guess think, thinking back, the, the the lovely thing on, on that day was, was seeing a, such a powerful culture and such a complete culture. And I guess it, for, for, for someone like myself, for it to be so powerful, you have to think about U European culture and how European culture has become diluted and has been thinned out and, and less easy to grasp. So if, if you were to say, even, even if you were a strong Christian, um, you know, went to church regularly, e even then, um, it, Christian culture has been thinned and, 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 and isn't, isn't as powerful and isn't all encompassing. And therefore to go to the Jain temple and see such a, such a strong community, such a complete community, everybody in the community, everybody part, part of that culture and seeing that that culture runs through all of them as individuals and co collectively and to see them so closely knit as a community and to see that culture reflected in every facet, the, the, the food, the clothes, the dance, the buildings, the ceremonies, ab absolutely everything was, was wonderful. Wonder, wonderful to see and to come out of that thinned out white European culture into this very intense three-dimensional full color Jane experience. And then the thing that then made it so special was how welcoming everyone was. And it was clear how proud everyone was of their culture. And again, you know, it, it, in, in the 21st century, it's very easy for people to be a little bit ashamed or a little bit shy about things they believe in or things that mean a lot to them or defensive. 
and there, there was a community of people who were truly proud of their culture and incredibly generous in wanting to share it and wanting to share the food and share the stories. It was, so so that, that, that analogy of it being just feeling very rich and complete and whole um, was, was very powerful. And yeah, so there was, yeah, there was a group of us, we were going to have our board meeting at the Jain Center. Remember, our project is to protect uh, British heritage. And we decided to come to this uh, festival of a culture which is very little known about in Britain and a very small community in terms of numbers, you know, maximum 35,000 uh, or 40,000 population in the whole of the UK. And, and, and we were having a festival which was a festival of fasting. So you actually joined us in the fast in the sense that you had the food which everyone else was eating. And uh, you know there were a group of volunteers cooking the food. There were another group of volunteers serving the food. And uh, Sir Andrew Motion, who was our chairman at that time, gave a little speech and he was welcomed and the community gave him a gift. And, and that whole experience, in fact, I remember not just you, but other board members who came said, and you know, many years later said it was such a memorable experience, you know, something so deep and profound. And like you say, when total strangers welcome you, I mean, in a way, uh, you know, communities, religious communities, you know, at one level are being seen as fundamentalists, as close-minded, dogmatic. And I wonder, did you see that kind of fundamentalism or dogmatism that day? No, not, not, not at all. And when, when you think about fundamentalism, you think of fundamentalism being manifest in two ways. One, being very defensive and being very aggressive. <laughs> so, so it is manifest in either a group being very defensive of, of their culture or trying to aggressively project it onto someone else. And what you felt with the Jains were they were incredibly relaxed mm. in that they didn't feel they, they had to defend it. They, they, they just felt they had to celebrate it, which felt fabulous. And what they nobody did was take us aside and say, you must become a Jane. They, they were incredibly relaxed about that. They, they, um, they, they took everybody um, else on their own merits. And I do think, you know, a, a pluralistic, multicultural world, you know, is at its best when everybody celebrates other other identity and identities and other cultures without feeling either defensive or aggressive to, towards them. And that, that day felt that 100 percent that there wasn't a single member of the Jane community who was thinking we don't want these people here or we have to teach these people something. They just felt very welcoming and that that was lovely. Yeah, I don't know if you know, but it's in the Indian tradition, there is a saying that uh, atiti devo bhava, a guest is like a god. So in some sense, the community were very honored that such executives, you know, involved in national heritage protection, you know, made the time to come and see them in their own true colors, you know. Uh, and, and meet them on their own terms. In fact, they were very surprised that we ate the, the fasting food rather than the, the food that they would serve visitors and guests. But we insisted that we wanted to be on the same terms with them. I, 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 I do remember that without being um, in any way insulting. If, if I remember rightly, it was the food that you eat coming out of a fast. So it has no salt, no sugar, no spices. Got so it. As, as somebody who adores Indian food, it was probably a little bit disappointing in that the food was so bland, but we absolutely understood that it was that process of coming out of the fast and therefore it made complete sense. No, it was actually part of the fast. You only eat one meal a day and that meal has to be very kind of basic, you know, uh, but even out of that, there were nine different varieties. Of, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, it, it, so. it, was, it was very interesting. But as you know, and this is often the case, the, the huge generosity of the community was that they wanted us to eat as much as possible. And, <laughs> uh, and um, 
you know, and it was lovely to do that, but you can only eat so much of that quite bland, um, bland, bland food. But, it, you know, that, that sense of be a community really wanting to be generous, not in a false way, but just naturally uh, left, left, a, left a profound uh, memory, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of our discussion on intangible heritage, right, there is that, we have, we've imported an ancient festival to Britain. We have imported this sense of, uh, you know, community values and building our own temple and community center uh, to Britain and, and actually created that physical space. But alongside that, we've imported kind of the, the, the produce which comes from vegetarian food, the kinds of uh, ways of cooking as well, you know, and the shared uh, eating and the shared cooking as well. These, I guess these are the kinds of things that you mean when you say intangible heritage. Can you expand a bit more on intangible heritage? Well, I think, firstly, I mean, the, 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 the point about food in societies and cultures is, is very powerful. And that sense that m many societies and many cultures through history for, there's been a shortage of food, um, and therefore it's a very powerful way of showing generosity, isn't it, and sharing. And the fact that many uh, Indi Indian communities, that idea of shared meals, shared cooking, shared meals, uh, comes across very powerfully. Um, and you, of course, you see it with the Sikhs as well, with the, you know, the fact that all those, you, you, know, you, you can go to any Sikh temple at any time and have a free, free meal. It's a very profound, um, very profound thing. Intangible heritage. So, of course, what I witnessed that day and what, what you know, the Jain community lives every day is, is indeed intangible heritage. So it's, it's strong heritage that, that doesn't have a physical form, you know, like religious icons. Or, but, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's heritage that is just lived um, and, and is often um, passed, passed down or, or, or across the community. But of course, intangible heritage, as, as we use it within the museum and heritage community, is a Western construction. And, and it comes out, comes from, it, so, you know, we, we have tangible heritage, you know, which is historic buildings and museum collections. And often they become a heritage because we're trying to preserve them. And we're trying to preserve them because we fear losing them. And it, it, intangible heritage is similar. So in its Western sense, we often talk about intangible heritage as things that are seen as threatened and disappearing. So in England in particular, you know, um, folk music, folk dance, perhaps um, traditional language, um, different ceremonies, but almost always ones that there is a sense that we need to preserve because, um, they had value and that value um, has somehow been lost, but they, 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 they need to be preserved. And, and of course, then when you come into contact with Jane or, or many other Eastern um, communities and cultures where, where, where it, would, it would qualify as intangible, but of course it isn't threatened and it isn't at risk and it isn't disappearing, it, it's living and, and therefore it's, you know, it, 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 it's a good, it's a useful term to use, to use, and it's a useful term in terms of debates about culture and community and heritage and value. But, but in a way, just as I've said to you in the past, why, why, why would the Jains need to have a museum of the Jain community? There's nothing that needs preserving because it, it, it's living. It, it's similar with the intangible heritage and what, you know, what, why would you need to go out of your way to try and preserve something which is still a living, living culture? I, I, I guess what, what is important in that, seeing it through that lens, is hopefully it gives it added value and reminds you, you as a community how, how valuable it is. And when you compare it with, um, if you like Western secular society, you know, many people will tell you that there are great 
advantages have come from Western secular society, you know, and I'm, you know, I, I'm part of that and, and agree, but, but there is also a sense of great loss in, in, in that many things have gone, um, both, both in terms of faith, but also in, in terms of music and song and yeah. other things. And therefore it's a reminder to the Jain community that, that they haven't lost it, but it is precious and therefore it makes it even more important to, um, to, yeah. to, to make yeah. the most of it. Yeah, that, that, that is the interesting point because remember we are not in India, we are living in the West. It's a very tangible culture. It's a very material culture. And also we are a, a business community as well. So in a way we have embraced the material culture, but we've always embraced the material culture. However, without compromising the intangible. But then now we face challenges. For example, our children growing up in this country, you know, have different cultural influences, right? Uh, to them, uh, some of these uh, traditions may seem outdated. The languages may not be accessible. The poetry and the literature is definitely not understandable or accessible. So in that sense, we are losing that intangible heritage. And the most, in a way, the most uh, interesting part is actually, I don't think that we are valuing it, right? That we are actually understanding that the physical temple may be beautiful and nice, but that's only a small part of our cultural story, you know? and that these kinds of values and culture that we have inherited. Remember also in that setting, you were our guests, but what happens, take the reverse situation when we go as guests to say an English uh, event or an English place, then, you know, it's like we, are, we have, uh, we, in fact, it's not even defensive. I think it's like, and I've experienced this many times, people don't even notice us. Or if they notice us, it, sometimes it may be a bit suspicious, or sometimes if it's not suspicious, then it's like, okay, you're kind of one of us, and rarely is food kind of served in those kinds of settings, you know, definitely not made and cooked by the community for the community, right? So, so we have those kind of contrasting experiences, and in that sense, uh, you know, there is a kind of subconscious inferiority uh, which we somehow have to carry. And now I'm, I would like to take you to the uh, setting of education, actually, and schooling, right? So our children are, you know, are born here and go to school here. Now, what would you say is the awareness in schools about intangible heritage? Well, I, and, and again, I, I think it's worth, you know, and you, you made the point at the beginning and I've, I've made, made the point since, the intangible heritage, you know, it's, it's, it's a construct and a concept that, that works for those who manage heritage. And, and, and there's that overlap with just real life, you know, <laughs> the, the, the real life experience. And, and I think, and, and I think the most valuable thing, and you know, you you just talked about it, is for to use it as a way to look at our, ourselves and others through a particular lens, which helps us realize how rich culture is, and hopefully help us want to preserve it as a as a living culture, but at the very least allow us to make those choices. And, and I think that thing about, you know, not realizing how lucky you are until something's gone or not missing something in, until it's gone, at the very least, you know, that realization that intangible heritage is real, our cultures are real, and that they are living, and that unless we look after them, they will go, and, and that at the very least, we shouldn't let them slip away, we should make a conscious decision. And then I guess in terms of ed education, then, you know, for me, the first thing is the recognition in somewhere like Britain of how many cultures there are and how rich they are and how all of them have value and all of them have worth and all of them should be celebrated. You know, whereas the very, you know, traditional idea 
unless you do it the British way, we're not interested. And any culture that isn't British culture is not of value. I think it's it, it should be the opposite. You know, it should be the opposite that, that all all cultures and are, are, are of value and all should be celebrated and and room should be found for all of them. In in the way that we were talking about the Jane Com culture, you know, the minute you're being defensive, it's not right. The minute you're being aggressive, it's not right. But if, if you can be welcoming and 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 generous, and I've. You know, I've always, you know, I don't, I don't have said this to you specifically, you know, someone who's come from a very monoculture, you know, I've, I've you know, I've grew, grown up as, as a white person in the same part of London, very specific culture. Um, I, I'm always so jealous of those who, who have more complicated mixed cultures. And we've talked before about often the Indian experience where you have an, an Indian culture, you know, often then an East African experience and a British experience, all, all uh, have made your, your cultures and your communities and individuals richer. And that for me is something, something and, I, and I know that there's been a lot of um, challenge and difficulties in that journey, hmm. but, it, but it's still something to be celebrated, not something um, not not something to be ashamed of, and I, and I know you know Indians not, and and we we should absolutely live in a culture where nobody should be ashamed, and nobody should feel a need that they have to assimilate with 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 the predominant culture, mm. and most most historians would say that through history, those places where you have had different cultures living al alongside each other in, in a relaxed way is often where, you know, civilization has been at its most civilized. Mm -hmm. um, and where you've had the opposite, you know, monocultures that have been aggressive towards other cultures uh, is where civilization has been at its least. Um, you, think of, you think of Nazi Germany, you know, you think of Stalinist Russia. Um, and, and, it, and that, for me, it should be a really simple lesson for, for education that, that um, generosity and acceptance of other, other cultures and their values should be a very basic tenet of ed, ed, education for me. Okay, that's really helpful, actually. So if I were to reflect on what you understand, what you mean by intangible heritage, I would say from our point of view, we have a strong oral tradition uh, so, you know, we, we actually memorize many songs, many prayers, uh, uh, and actually, you know, we have, yeah, and our, because of our philosophy is very, very complex, we have a hugely rich literary tradition, yeah, which actually very few of our uh, young generation, including educated professionals, are even aware of. But uh, I, I remember a professor at uh, King's College London once saying that the Jains are the master storytellers of India. Now, if you think of Indian storytelling tradition, right? And then he says the Jains are the master storyteller. And of course, as I have started digging into that history, I realized that whole languages and grammar were set by Jain monks. Gujarati language, which is a massive global language today, or the uh, Kannada language, which again was Jain monks were, were instrumental in setting the grammar and uh, the script for the language, etc. So there is that oral culture. Then there is the whole culture around family and community. So this kind of shared coexistence, um, uh, you know, intergenerational living, for example, even, which is at one level is seen today as kind of out of fashion. Uh, but you know, it has got benefits, especially when we talk about loneliness of elders today, right? Uh, and isolation and depression as a result of loneliness. So we've got this kind of strong uh, family structures, uh, which we kind of inherited from the past. And then we have uh, in our marriages, as you know, the guest list is minimum 800 people. And that's also because we actually keep in touch 
with the family on both sides, you know, and uh, uncles and uncles of uncles and aunts of aunts and things like that. So, so that kind of very rich uh, record keeping of all the relatives, uh, inviting them to your uh, important events, uh, sharing in grief, for example, you know, if somebody dies, I mean, it's not uncommon that the, the first memorial is usually held the next day in the evening. And in London, there would be at least a thousand people for that memorial service. So people would stop everything. And these people, some of them could be relatives, some uh, neighbors, some members of the community just paying the respects, etc. And And, you know, so that's a kind of, so you share both in the sorrows and in the joys of life, right? Then we got this whole, the musical tradition is so vast, you know, uh, and uh, again, the poetry around the music, the messages, you know, I'm, I'm writing, you know, my expertise is business ethics uh, and uh, I'm writing another book at the moment. And I was just trying to go back to, to my childhood memories. And I remember in Mombasa, we used to have live, music cost concerts during the festival where the musicians came from India and and they would you know have the traditional instruments and when you listen to the words that they are saying uh, for example Shantilal Shah who was a major poet of that time he actually came to Mombasa to sing and perform and in the song he starts by saying uh, that you know we are very wealthy, but we have forgotten the meaning of charity. So indirectly through the song, he is pricking our conscience to say that, you know, alongside your material wealth, be re remembered to share it and to give it generously, you know, things like that. So what you have is a, almost like a business ethics message being delivered to the community without anyone's fingers being pointed at, right? So it's not saying, you, businessman, you better, you know, give your share of your profits to the community, right? But indirectly, through that kind of reflexivity and music, right, we are reminded of our conscience, of our values. Uh, again, so that's one aspect of the culture. The other thing is about learning and uh, respect for scholarship, respect for knowledge and reading. That has been very old in our tradition. And in fact, we've actually decorated our manuscript. So we, we've hired artists uh, in, in, in the past to paint our manuscripts or paint, illustrate our manuscripts. So there has been some tangible art next to it, but alongside it is this deep respect for wisdom and wisdom wherever it may come from. You know, uh, not just uh, from the monks and nuns, but any writers, knowledge, science. So there is that which we have inherited. So this is a kind of a habit of mind that we have inherited, which is priceless, but maybe we have forgotten to acknowledge the kind of the cultural uh, character of that habit, you know. Uh, similarly, uh, I mean, with business, I, I'm writing, I've just written a chapter on tacit skills. So, you know, uh, in uh, universities and the professions, we teach business education, but it's very formulaic and it's very universalist as well. So there's no sense of different cultures looking at business differently, understanding risk differently, uh, where a family business means, uh, you know, a shared business and where everyone is willing to put in the hours for the success of the business. There's trust, loyalty, relationships, all these aspects of tacit skills, which I know I inherited from childhood are never mentioned in the business textbook. So they're not even mentioned, let alone discussed, right? And that is partly because of this deep secularism in business education and almost the thing that, you know, there is, I mean, come on, if you can't hold something, how can you value it? If it's intangible, it's valueless. But here you are saying that actually there is tremendous value in that intangible. And I absolutely agree with you. Another aspect is art, Hedley. Now, you know, you, 
I, through the MLA, actually, I learned one of the issues that the Heritage Community is saying is, why don't your people come regularly to our art galleries and museums? But this is not how we understand art. Art is something that you wear. Art is something that you eat. Art is something that you worship. Yeah, uh, something that you hold, something that you enjoy. Uh, something that you do for yourself without even calling it art. So this idea of art as something that is displayed in a gallery, or even this idea of professional art. In fact, you know, most of our temples, the sculptures are anonymous, you know, right now. If I mean, these stunning uh, temples, you, you, we've all heard of uh, Machiavelli and uh, what's the... Um, Leonardo da Vinci and how great sculptors they were, uh, right? Uh, but the Indian sculptors who sculpted these amazing Jain temples all over India, and even those who do it today, I mean, even the sculptors who sculpted the, the temple in London, which is in my background, no names, you know, uh, and uh, as and as a result, no egos also, but this idea of, again, art as an offering, right? So we have a very different approach to art. And if our community, so therefore, when we walk into those gallery or museum spaces, at one level, there is a kind of alienation going on. I mean, to take an example, like a murti, which we are used to seeing either inside a temple uh, or inside the home temple suddenly gets displayed in the British Museum or the VNA Museum as an object of art. Now, how do we respond to that? We get a bit confused, yeah? So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and uh, how... Well, of, of course, you're, you're exactly right that the Western Museum and the Western Art Gallery are in effect secular temples, they're, they're, and if you like, they're temples to the enlightenment. So they're, 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 they're devoid of faith. They've replaced faith in, in the West. And, you know, the examples you give. So, you know, many, many Western art galleries are full of art that was originally in churches, you know, it was originally religious art. And it's been, it's been taken out of that context and put in a new context. And, and that changing context, takes away its original meaning and gives it a new new meaning. And you know, you're you're exactly right that if you go to museums that that celebrate Indian or you know is, is Islamic art, it's taken it out of its faith context and given it a new new context. And that's a Western context. And I and I absolutely under, understand that um, you know museums I I I I wrote a book about you know, museums around the world and, you know, doing it made me realize how, what the museums are very much a, a Western Enlightenment creation. And when you find them elsewhere in the world, it's almost always a colonial, as a result of colonial, colonialism. And therefore, I, I absolutely understand, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I adore museums. It's, it, it's been my life and I see huge value in them. But I can absolutely understand why some people don't value them or some people don't understand them and I you know I, I would still hope that once they were decoded and you understood them there, there is still a great amount to get out of them but but you should you should always remember they are what they are and actually I, I remember as a very young man that you know quite early in my career going going to Paris and um, and some a Frenchman in the hotel lobby say, you know, where are you going? And I said, I'm, I'm going to the Louvre. And he said, no, you know, uh, uh, cultural cemetery. He said, that is a cultural cemetery. You don't want to go, you want to go to the market. You want, you want to go. Um, and of course he's right, you know, and it goes back to this point about heritage and intangible heritage, that the minute you are worried about them, the minute you're trying to preserve them, the minute you, you try and categorize them, the minute you try and catalog them, you're, you're turning them into something else. Um, and, it, and, it, and the suggestion is they, and you're giving them a different meaning. And therefore it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. 
that if you have a living culture that is rich, cel celebrate it and look after it and keep it living and accept, accept that the world changes all the time and people change and, and for communities like your own that have traveled across the world and have come into contact with other cultures, of course there will be pressures and of course you will change and you will evolve and you will adapt and you will, you will make your place in the world, but, but try not to let, let your rich culture slip through your hands without at least recognizing, it's, recognizing it for what it is. And of course, it's also the case, isn't it, that, that if, if a group of people with a strong culture go somewhere else where there are other cultures, it makes them want to cling on to their culture e even more be because it is the thing that, that defines them. And that's, that, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But yeah, you know, just going back to the whole traditional Western idea of heritage, it's very much about power and control and about, um, yeah, power, power and control and about preserving things that in a way are already beyond preservation. And that's okay, but don't confuse that with living, living cultures and living heritage and, and um, living communities. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful, actually. I mean, I'm just thinking again, you know, from a parent child perspective. So, you, you know, you go in school, uh, the chances are that there isn't, you know, because schools are quite standardized kind of education factories, you know, and that space for individual culture, if, if anything, would be on the, would be on the margins. Uh, and also there is that kind of pressure to fit in as well. So, but then in the home, we have the, we have the chance to celebrate this intangible culture and our mothers are excellent at doing that. In fact, actually, when we look at our history, it's the women who have protected intangible heritage and passed it on through generations. Uh, so I guess, uh, what would be your advice to a young parent who wants to give the best to her uh, children, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, and and similarly, I mean, I, I feel, you know, that the men in the community are much more culturally illiterate, much more materialistic, and, uh, and kind of limited in their talent and scope, you know, compared to the women. So we also need to address that kind of gender issue about intangible heritage. The men, definitely very few of them would see value in intangible heritage or would even understand what intangible heritage means, right? Uh, so how can we educate? We've, I mean, we've, we've talked about this before and as parents, we also both know from practical experience that probably the last thing you do with children is try and force them to do it, to do, to do anything. And, you know, and I, I remember my own experience of being a young person. If, if your parent tells you something is really important, you immediately do, do, do the opposite. So I think the first thing is to be relaxed. But I think, I, I think as we've said before, don't, don't be ashamed of, of your great culture. Celebrate it and live it in a relaxed way. Acknowledge that young people will experiment and try you new things, but if something is genuine and authentic and real, they'll, and is there in front of them, and they are surrounded by it, um, don't also underestimate how important it will be to them. And, and I think, you know, you will find lots of young people who might be telling you they're horrified by traditional culture, but on, just on the surface, it's incredibly important to them. And, and it's, it's part of them, and that, that, that won't go away and have patience um, that they'll come around to it. But you're, you're, you're right, I think, to be concerned. And, and all, I mean, you know, we, we, live, we live in a world that is changing so rapidly and has so many influences upon it. 
and they're, they're so complicated. You know, as, as you know, um, I spend a lot of my life in, in Sweden and Swedish children are now growing up with almost better English than Swedish because of Facebook and because, you know, but they spend so much time listening to English and um, that, so all of the, all of those influences, we, we can't pretend they're not there, but I think it's wrong to um, try and be overprotective because that, that way I think lies failure. But, but going back to what we've said about once we've, once we have recognized how valuable living culture is, both in an intangible and a tangible way, and celebrating and living it. And I, and I think with, with children, you know, what, what you hopefully do is, is show them what, what is there and hopefully they make up their own minds. And, um, and I would hope and expect that um, over time, um, people do, do recognize the richness of their heritage. And I do think, um, you know, when identity becomes more important than ever, having a strong identity is, is, is a really important thing to be, to be, to be celebrated. Mm. But I wouldn't pretend that it isn't a very complicated world we now live in. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's very, very honest of you and uh, very also, yeah, very helpful, actually. But I also think that we can be creative about how, you know, once we understand the intangible culture, we can be creative about how we, we try to uh, protect and pass it to future generations. I mean, take an example of, I mean, if you go back again to your memory about visiting the Oshwal Center, there was no place where the culture was explained and the values and the science. I mean, remember, this is a culture of nonviolence, a culture of respect for all living beings a culture of pluralism, a culture of non-materialism, right? These are values for our time, if, if ever, you know, uh, because, you know, respect for environment. So you know, a lot of young people are passionate about these issues, you see, but they have not made that connection that in their own heritage and culture lies that richness uh, because they are used to seeing a kind of what you would call uh, a, a very kind of or to thinking that you know it's a very ritualistic very dogmatic very traditional culture which is out of touch with modernity and reality right so so an example that we could have is an exhibition space yeah so not a museum <laughs> not a museum but an exhibition space for visitors which explains the basics in a scientific way because we are in an age of science, but at the same kind of time, hopefully, the visitors find the get a basic understanding, and the members of the community get reinforced about about their own culture and its vision and values. Because you know, I mean, I would say probably about seventy percent of the men in our community. If you ask them, can you explain to me? what are the basics of your culture, uh, they would not be able to do that, you know. So, you know, because they've been so busy with their business. And so they're very practical, pragmatic. And, and in some sense also, yeah, the money has, has kind of devalued culture in inverted commas. You know, this pursuit of wealth and material has meant that we've started to devalue these kind of intangible aspects of our culture. So I think we can be creative. We are extremely well resourced, you know, uh, endowed as a community globally, and even in Britain, you know. Uh, so in that sense, you know, I would love it, and I find this a real challenge. That you know, we know from our science and history that wealth does not last, but culture definitely lasts, right? So then how can we convince these very, very successful and wealthy business people who actually live quite simply that just as they invest in different uh, uh, 
financial and commercial projects, they ought to set aside a, a small pot for investment in cultural protection and also to work with professional creative entrepreneurs who find new ways of resolving uh, this, the challenge of cultural uh, preservation and cultural adaptation as well. Yeah. So, you know, if we can do something like that, there would be a meeting because the kinds of skills that your sector and professionals like you possess is also helpful to us because, you know, you can guide us and, and we can work with you, but at the same time, it also helps us that when, you know, as you, as you and I have often joked, when we go out in the world, we are asked to spell the word Jane, right? So we, if we were to value our heritage and say, no, it is our duty to go beyond the spelling and to help inform people about what we stand for, what we believe in without an intention of converting them, but at least to protect and to empower our own young people. You know, I, to give you an example, I found many young professionals, when I look at what they do in their career, how they behave and act, it is so Jane, I cannot believe it. Yet, oh, when we start talking about Jane, oh, I'm not Jane, I'm not Jane, right? And, and they, they become either defensive or negative about it because they have a very partial or incomplete or traditional understanding of the philosophy and the heritage, right? So... I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I, I think artists have a part to play because artists, particularly, you know, young contemporary artists have a very powerful way of reflecting culture. I think, as you just said, we, we often, underestimate how deep culture is within us. So, you know, if, if, if you took someone like Richard Dawkins, who is an avowed science atheist, if you delved into him, he would have guilts and morals that have come out of a Christian background, you know, and as, as you've just said, if, if you've come from a Jain background, you'll have Jainism running through you. And, and if you can gently, um, remind people that so much of what they do and say and think has come from that tradition and that they they are of that tradition we are we are there are very few of us in the world who aren't of a culture um except for so so many of us particularly in the west as i said it's become so thin and dispersed whereas within something like the jane community it's still so strong We've said this before, one of the problems with the Jain community, you're so polite and, um, and genteel, you know, that um, society around you hasn't felt a need to um, worry about you too much. You know, you, you, you're um, such wonderful members of community. You know, there are, there are other cultures where um, the West has, has had to work harder to make, to understand other, other cultures and, um, and, and try and understand them be, be, because they, they feel threatened by them um, in, in a way that um, the Jane community and, you know, in a wonderful way is, isn't threatening. It's interesting that throughout this conversation, Hedley, you've used the word culture when in, in the outer world, there is a, a line between culture and religion. You know, and uh, whereas I never see when I look at my community, I don't see that line at all. And it, in fact, I feel that that line has been imposed. But also, not a, even our scholars, you know, scholars of Jainism, most of whom are not Jain, but they often have debates about is Jainism a philosophy or a religion, and and I find it really frustrating <laughs> when I hear these kinds of debates because to me. It is, you know, it is definitely a living culture of which, you know, knowledge, wisdom, belief is a part of, you know. So what do you say to that boundary between culture and religion? It, that, you know, my, the, you know, it's where I have to be very honest in the, where, where I come from. 
in terms of my my worldview now is is a worldview that where where faith has been separated out from 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 culture and 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 you know we've had this conversation before that within the sort of western academic and most western traditions um faith has now become a bit difficult and a bit almost a bit embarrassing and 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 therefore they they are separated out but i I understand what you're saying 100% that for most most of history and for most cultures faith faith and culture are just you know part part of exact exactly the same thing and um, and of course different cultures at different times and in different places they're, they're layered in different ways you know so that the, the Jewish faith and Jewish people are, you know a very obvious example of one where they're just completely as one although even there you know you, you'll find secular Jews and um, for, for religion. But, but, but yeah, I mean, and as I said, you and I have talked about this many times before, that if, if you want to engage with, you know, Western academia, Western politics, Western um, heritage, Western education, you have to accept that faith and culture are, and are, are, are separated out. Um, and you have to go, you have to go back to, um, Protestant Reformation and then the Enlightenment and you know Darwinism and a whole series of reasons why that is, but that that is as it is, and that that is an a, a added challenge for 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 those communities for whom faith are and culture are what as one. I mean the other uh, difficulty, uh, the other issue I have is around this word community. I mean economists, right? World famous economists like Professor Rajan of the University of Chicago are now saying that communities are at the heart of any economy, right? That that you don't. It's not just about individuals or markets or the state. You also need communities. Yeah, but when you read the book. The book is extremely secular and, and is talking about communities as if, you know, isn't this a nice idea to have? And it completely ignores the vast swathe of especially faith communities all around the world, world, right? Which are actually upholding some system of ethics, some system of trust, of relationships, of belonging. <laughs> You know, which uh, obviously these kind of secular academics, Kay and Collier have just written a book called Greed is Dead, which are another kind of famous uh, development economist. And again, half the book is about communities, but there is no reference as such to faith communities and how much they give to the world uh, every day, sometimes quietly. Uh, you know, uh, and you know, you mentioned the Sikh communities, or you know, I mean, there's so many the Ismaili communities, and you know, communities take a long time to build. They don't just happen overnight. We're seeing in the pandemic suddenly, you know, you can't create a community in a pandemic. Either you have it or you don't. If you have it, that community really comes together, and if you don't, the loneliness really becomes stifling, right? So. So how can we, you know, educate the West to take us seriously, you know, about how we hold these communities, the sacrifices we make, the volunteers, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, uh, I was, for this oral history, I was interviewing a lady from, who was one of the community leaders in Mombasa, Sushila Ben Shah. And she said to me, she, she, she was talking about that same festival that she attended. She said, one month before the festival, we have to order all the ingredients. And then when I'm with, in a meeting with the women, I say to them, right, who is going to volunteer to sift the dal? Who is going to sort out the rice and make sure it's clean and all the dirty rice is taken out? Who's going to sort out the, the flour? Who's going to... You know, all right, okay, so I'm going to ask the shop to deliver it to your house so that you can sort it out in time before the festival. And then we will collect it from your house and bring it to the festival. And then we will, do you see what I mean? So kind of the level of detailed planning required, the, the different skills uh, and volunteers involved. 
I mean, all of that actually weaves a community together. And faith is that kind of mystical, yet kind of intimate glue that brings people together. It's not perfect. I agree with you, you know, but let's not deny its value and let's work with the value that faith has. You know? yeah. And it is real. It is real. Community is real. You're, you're absolutely right. And it is valued, but it is more and more tricky. Again, in, you know, Western urban world, ne the, the term neighborliness is another powerful you know, and we've seen that in the last year, you know, the sense of being neighbourly. And, and ironically, you know, um, my, my parents who are very aged and live in South East London, they would be the first to admit that the people that have been most neighbourly to them in the last year are the members of the Indian community. You know, that, you know, the, the, the people who, you know, knock on their door and check they're okay, the thing that do the, the people who do them favours, are often the members of the Indian community. Um, and I, I think there, there is a great irony that many white English people's very traditional view of what the best of being English is, is now seen in Indian community. That sense of being good neighbors, of looking after families, um, of having strong families, of, of having um, a strong tradition you see that more, you know, that is valued by white, white culture, but often isn't there anymore. Although they still talk about it as being a great value. It, it is there in, 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 in the Indian community. That sense of, um, you know, working very hard for, unselfishly for a community and for a family, which, which you see in, um, in the Indian community. So it, it, you know, you're absolutely right, community is, is there and is is strong, but is under threat, you know, and and you know and and th those things that pull against it, you know. So what? Why? Why do some people pull against it? Often younger people who want to feel more individualistic and feel constrained by it. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm I'm a historian and archaeologist. I'm not a sociologist, so you know, I don't, I wouldn't pretend to. To, to know what the answers there are, but being honest and open about those things, accepting how, how important it is, but also accepting why some people find it tricky, I think is, I think is important. And that, and that, and you know, that those values that all of us, almost all of us would consider as being most important, you know, being open-minded, being generous, being welcoming, you know, that are so strong in the Indian community, continuing to just hold by those, you would hope, you know, would, would, would hold community together. And also volunteering is such a great way of uh, reminding us uh, about selflessness, about, yeah. uh, you know, to step out of our own selves and our own immediate needs. And, and it's part of that intangible heritage as well. I mean, you know, my father, literally you know he, he volunteered seven days a week probably 10 hours a day he only did enough business to be able to pay his bills and a little bit of saving but his priority was not material at all he absolutely loved the community and it was because of sacrifices of people like him that we are where we are today so today's uh, business community living in such a material, tangible world has forgotten to value that precious charity that people give in the form of volunteering, you know? And also through volunteering, you gain so much confidence, so much relationship skills, you actually get to know a wider network of people. So there are lots of uh, subtle advantages of volunteering. Um, so again, yeah, so, but, you know, faith, and history and tradition give us that kind of uh, magnetic field and um, to bring us together and to keep us together uh, and the resilience to be able to survive. So thank you so much for sharing uh, all your wisdom and knowledge and for encouraging us to, you know, to protect and to celebrate uh, our, our inheritance, our tangible, our sorry, intangible heritage. 
Um, and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch with you and perhaps working with uh, the pavilion in the future, you know, and supporting some of the work that you do and uh, working together to, to preserve this kind of heritage, you know. So I'll I, just I mean, tell you, I mean, when we talked before, we talked about um, how the pavilion had been a hospital in the First World War for Indian soldiers. And just, you know, the, the meeting I had prior to my meeting with you today was with a, a, a fine friend of mine down here, Davinda Dillon, who looks after the Chatri, which is the, on the South Downs where the, the, the Sikh and Hindu soldiers were cremated if they died. And um, we were just talking about the annual festival. Um, so, you know, th th there are parts of Indian culture um, absolutely alive and Indian communities alive down here that, you know, interweave with the work we do here. And it, that, that's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your time and generosity. Well, thank and you and, and thank you for everything you're doing. It's so lovely to talk to you, Isabel. Yeah, thanks. Just a second. Let me just pause.